All right. Thank you, Emily. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is well caffeinated after coffee. And uh, we're going to take a little bit of a different direction for the next 25 minutes or so. And I'm going to talk to you about how stars influence their planets. And I did a little bit of a count while giving myself a little practice yesterday. And I think I talk about stars more than planets in this talk. So please keep your attention. And uh, <laughs> hopefully I will convince you over the next 25 minutes or so why stars matter, why star planet interactions matter, and how you can use them in your research. And so let's get the elephant in the room over with here. Essentially, the SOC asked me, to answer this question for you. And so if you take nothing else away from this talk, you can at least say if someone asks you this question, well, I did sit in on a 25 minute talk about star planet interactions and magnetic fields once. So you all get a pass from that. <laughs> so what are star planet interactions? Why do they matter? And so this movie is one of my favorite movies that really does an excellent job of giving the talk for me. It really shows why star planet interactions are important. And so here what you're seeing is a coronal mass ejection. You're seeing the sun emitting this huge energetic event of particles towards the earth. And you're seeing the particles actually go around the, the earth. They're being deflected by the magnetic field of the earth. And so star planet interactions, exoplanetary magnetic fields are really fundamental and they can tell us a lot about things like a planet's potential for habitability. They also give us insights into the interior structure of planets, uh, the exterior as well. And so they're a really fundamental part of uh, the atmospheric part of a, of a planetary picture. And so what are star planet interactions? Well, I just kind of summarized this, but just to show it with a, an even more dramatic image. I love this image from the KISS report on exoplanetary magnetism. And what you see here is the space weather environment around an exoplanet. So the star can emit radiation in the form of flares. You get these highly energetic photons being emitted from the star. You get highly energetic particle events such as coronal mass ejections. And these get emitted from the star and they travel through the interplanetary medium and coupled together, they kind of, they form what we call the space weather environment that a planet sees. And so the work that we're doing on star planet interactions and detecting exoplanetary magnetic fields is all about the interplay between these phenomena. So how does space weather impact an exoplanet? So we're all familiar with the Earth orbiting the sun at about one AU. I like to think of that distance actually in terms of solar radii. And so one AU is about 215 uh, solar radii. And so what happens when you bring a planet closer in to its parent star? Most hot Jupiters, which is the bulk of the work we've been focusing on here with SPY, a star planet interactions, I'll refer to it as SPY as I go forward. Hot Jupiters orbit about 20 times closer to their parent star than we do to the sun. And so you go from being about 200 solar radii away to about 10 solar radii away. And here's a simulation of uh, HD 189733B by my colleague Alini Vidotto, where she looked at the space weather environment of this hot Jupiter. And essentially what we find is that these close-in planets experience in general a much harsher environment. The density of the, so the stellar wind is much higher. The ambient magnetic field that these planets are being bathed in is much higher. And they just receive a higher radiative flux. And so all of this kind of sums together to, to show that the space weather environment is much harsher for these close-in planets. And so just to show this one more time, this is a, a, an image of the sun during an eclipse. And again, I've put to scale here the uh, an exo, a hot Jupiter orbiting about five so, uh, solar radii away here. And you can see the coronal streams here. You can see the sun's magnetic field. And you can see this planet, if it had a magnetic field, they're going to be interacting. These magnetic fields are coupling. There's all sorts of cool physics happening here. And there's going to be consequences of being so close to your star. Uh, for the planet, you'll have likely atmospheric escape. I'll touch on that during this talk. If the planet is magnetized, which we hope it is, uh, it'll have likely auroral and radio emission. I'll also touch on that and probably increased tidal heating. But the star will also experience a consequence of having such a large planet so close. 
Uh, there'll be likely magnetic interactions, tidal interactions, and these kind of all manifest themselves as an enhanced stellar activity. And that's one of the ways that we go about detecting star planet interactions. And so this is probably a field that not many of you think about on a daily basis. And so how do we actually go about detecting SPY? Well, it's pretty simple. What we do is we look essentially for enhanced activity of some form that phases with the orbital period of a planet. And so the very early searches here for star planet interactions that I'll cover looked at enhanced chromospheric activity. And so if your enhanced chromospheric activity phases with the rotation period of the star, you would say, well, that's a star spot and you'd move on with your day. But if in fact it phased with the orbital period of the planet, then you could say this is actually induced uh, emission caused by the presence of a hot Jupiter. And this is kind of how the early searches for star planet interactions were led. And so here is a dynamo simulation uh, from Antoine Strugarek's work. And you can see here the, the star has its big dipolar magnetic field. And he's embedded a hot Jupiter here that has its own magnetic field. And these fields interact. There's reconnection events that occur. And if the planet is close enough to the star, magnetic information can actually flow back from the planet to the surface of the star. And you see this foot point up here. This is uh, the, the location of the field line that connects the planet to the star. And we believe that would induce uh, a hot spot on the surface of the star, this enhanced chromospheric activity. And so my colleague and mentor Evgenia Skolnik was one of the first people to actually search for this sort of emission. And here you, what you're seeing is some very high resolution optical spectra of the planet host HD 179949. This is the line core of the calcium K. This is at 393 nanometers. So at the very blue end of the optical, it's very different to the infrared wavelengths we've been mostly talking about during this workshop. And what you can see here on the, the left plot is a zoom in of the line core here. And we've got some photospheric lines on the wings of the line here, and then the line core in the center. And what you find if you observe this system over an orbital period of the planet is you see that the, the photospheric lines, they're pretty stable. There's very little variability here. But when you go into the core of this line, this is an active line, this is probing the chromosphere of the, the star, you see variability. And you can see that in the residuals here on the right-hand side. You can see the line core is varying with time as the emission level is changing. And so what Evgenia and her team did was they took observations of this system over multiple orbits of the planet around the star, and they produce this nightly residual. They sum this residual flux. And what they find is that the variability, the enhancement phases with the orbital period of the planet. And so this is one of the first tentative signatures of a star planet interaction. And here I'm just showing two orbits of the planet on the x-axis against this residual flux on the, on the y-axis. And this is all the data that we have on this system to spanning uh, multiple years of data here. And what you can see is this enhanced activity doesn't actually follow the substellar point of the planet. So it's not in completely tied in to the orbit of the planet. And this is a really nice example of something that uh, Lee actually talked about in his talk, where the material doesn't flow directly from the planet onto the star. It actually follows the magnetic field. And this is a beautiful simulation by Matt Sakos et al. in 2015, where they tried to model this sort of star planet interaction. And they actually find that you can get material flowing from the planet onto the star that leads the planet by about a 30 degree uh, orbital phase. And so this is one of a really nice uh, proof of concept of the work that Evgenia and her team had done on star planet interactions in a simulation sense. And so there's this beautiful relation for the solar system bodies here on the left. These are all the magnetized bodies in the solar system where you plot their magnetic moment uh, relative to their mass divided their rotation. And you find this beautiful linear relation. And so what we did, one of the first things we did for star planet interactions was do this in the equivalent in the optical for these systems. And you find a similar sort of relation. Systems where we find spy all kind of lie on this straight line, except for this one notable exception, uh, Tau Butis over here. This is a 
very large hot Jupiter that's actually synced with its star. The rotation period of the star is just over three days. The orbital period of the planet is just over three days. And so what we find here is that the planet isn't actually plowing through the magnetic field very fast. And so this is great. We have tentative signatures of SPY. How do you back out the magnetic field strength of the planet? That's kind of what we as SPY enthusiasts are after. And so my colleague Nuccio Lanza came up with this very simple prescription for how we can explain SPY uh, in 2012. And essentially the relation between the SPY power is related to the stellar magnetic field, the planetary field, and the relative velocity that the planet is experiencing as it orbits through the stellar wind. So SPY power, uh, thanks to my colleague Wilson Corley, can be derived. He, uh, took all the previous observations that we have of these hot Jupiter systems to search for this enhanced chromospheric activity. And he was able to do some really careful flux calibration, which if any of you have worked with high-res optical spectra, you know just how hard that is. And he was able to actually convert the residual flux levels into an absolute power. And so that gives us spy power. So great. Spy pack, right? <laughs> um, I had not made that joke before. Thank you for <laughs> pointing that out. <laughs> so next up, and this is also the only equation I'm showing, uh, just not to be uh, scared here. The uh, stellar magnetic field, how do we go about observing stellar magnetic fields? Well, this is the talk in of itself, and it is far above my pay grade to uh, explain this process of Zeeman Doppler imaging, but I'll show you these very cool movies from my colleague Oleg Kuchikov. And so we use a combination of Doppler imaging, which enables us to recover dark spots on the surface of the star. And this is done with uh, non-polarized light. This is just in basic intensity. Many of you are familiar with this from the radial velocity world. We couple that with circularly polarized light where the presence of a magnetic field causes Zeeman splitting. And you can use the circularly polarized light to actually recover regions of the star that are radially emitting magnetic field or azimuthally emitting magnetic field. You can see here's a, a radial spot coming out here and you see this beautiful uh, Delta Scuti style um, feature here in the profile. And this enables us when you couple those together to recover what the surface of the magnetic field of the star is doing. So great, we have our stellar magnetic field. Now you can put these as boundary conditions into some form of MHD model or simple potential field model to extrapolate what the corona of the star is doing uh, out at the orbital distance of the planet. And this is a beautiful example of this. This is Kepler 78. This is Zeeman Doppler imaged map as the surface of the star here. Red is positive field, blue is negative field. And this is run through a very simple potential field source surface model extrapolation by my PhD advisor, Moira Jardin in St. Andrews. And what you find here is the, the white loops in this animation are the hot closed coronal loops. These are the X-ray emitting high temperature regions of the, stel of the stellar corona. And the blue is the open field lines. These are the lines of which material is escaping from, from the system. And you can see I've overplotted Kepler 78's orbit here. And so that enables us, one of the outputs of these simulations is the, relative, the speed of the wind at the orbit of the planet. And so now we have everything we need to actually recover the planetary magnetic field. And again, my colleague Wilson Corley put this work into context. Uh, this was published in 2019, and we have some of the first detections of absolute magnetic field strengths in terms of Gauss for uh, hot Jupiters. And we find they have a magnetic field of about 20 to 120 Gauss. So that's kind of a brief history of the spectroscopic side of star-planet interactions. This is an atmospheres conference, so I thought I'd be remiss if I didn't show you some actual atmosphere observations. Um, one of the first that I was involved with was the, the potential detection of the magnetosphere of WASP-12b uh, using uh, Hubble observations. This is near ultraviolet observations where we, where we postulate that what we're seeing here is actually the presence of the magnetosphere of the planet. And so on the, on the right here, you can see the optical light curve of WASP-12b in white and overplotted in red are some HST magnesium-2 line. These are near ultraviolet observations of the system. And what you see is the transit is much deeper in the ultraviolet, but it also begins earlier than the optical light curve, but it ends simultaneously with the optical. 
And what we postulated is this is actually the interaction of the stellar wind compressing on the magnetosphere of the planet, causing this shock that moves in front of the system. Now, I will say this is being debated in the literature, um, as all good scientific results should be. There's uh, also other theories out there, but this is just one interpretation of this. And if this system is indeed what we're seeing here is the magnetosphere of the planet, we're able to place an upper constraint on the magnetosphere of the planet at about 24 Gauss. And uh, this was done from space with HST. Uh, my colleague Wilson Corley did a similar analysis with uh, H-alpha observations of HD 189733, and again, was able to find a field strength of about 28 Gauss, which is in line with our chromospheric enhanced activity measurements, which is a, a pretty cool, nice confirmation there. And so I'm sure many of you have also seen these incredibly cool, deep Lyman alpha transits uh, in, in the literature recently. And so if you have your broadband optical transit, again, you get the classic U shape to the light curve. But if we look at very high energy transits, like in the Lyman alpha line, where we're probing neutral hydrogen, we're probing very high up in the atmosphere of the planet, we actually see these incredibly deep uh, transits. This is just a cartoon here. But uh, this is one of my favorite observations. This is GJ436b. This is a warm Neptune orbiting around a low mass star. And the optical transit is this tiny bump up here. And when you look in Lyman Alpha, you see this incredible long transit here. And what we believe here is happening is the stellar wind is injecting into the, the planet's atmosphere here, ionizing material and causing the planet to have a huge amount of mass loss and escape, planetary atmospheric escape. And so this was done in Lyman Alpha, similar work uh, done in helium from, again, from HST by Jess Spake's group. And they see again, this increased uh, transit depth around the helium one line, which again is an indication of the stellar wind injecting material into the atmosphere, causing this atmospheric escape. And so this is a beautiful cartoon by my colleague, Alini Vidotto at Leiden. And uh, it just kind of shows how this process works where you have your hydrogen rich atmosphere and you have this energetic particles, this energetic material fo uh, photons in XUV, this is X-ray and UV emission. In entering into the atmosphere of the planet, exciting the, 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 fo the atmosphere, heating it up and allowing this material to escape. And so one of the interesting consequences of this is that the amount of atmospheric escape is technically tied to how active your star is. And so as stars age, they tend to calm down much like people. Um, and so here I'm just showing X-ray emission versus age for a solar type star. This is some simulation work. And you see as stars age, they get older. But also don't forget, I told you at the start of this talk that hot Jupiters, planets that are much closer to their star are embedded in this much denser stellar wind. And so these planets that are close in, even if they're around older stars are probably getting a much heavier irradiation from this ultraviolet emission, which can cause this increased planetary escape. This is another beautiful example of this. This is HD 189733 taken on two epochs here. In April 2010, they essentially see no increased uh, Lyman alpha absorption. But in 2011, they see an almost 20% depth in the transit. And uh, coincidentally, this team took X-ray observations leading up to the transit. And there's a flare that occurs about eight hours before the transit begins. And so one of the possible interpretations here is that the, the flare is in, in, in putting these energetic photons and pro particles into the atmosphere of the planet. Uh, you can see this beautiful simulation here down the bottom that increases the and planetary flow. And so this allows for this increased uh, planetary escape, which results in this deep transit that they saw on HD 189 in 2011. And so I think the message here is just that the stars do influence their planets. And I think we need to be uh, really aware of what's going on on the star when we're taking observations of planetary transits. So just finally, I've got about five minutes left. I'm going to talk very briefly about radio emission, which I think is one of the most promising methods for detecting exoplanetary magnetic fields. And so there are two types of radio emission we can search for when looking for exoplanets. We can look at planet uh, radio emission from the planet itself in the form of aurora, we see that here on Earth. You're all probably seen images of the northern and the southern lights, these beautiful glows 
caused by the solar wind impacting on the Earth's magnetosphere. You can see the simulation here kind of outlines the process where the solar wind impacts on the magnetosphere of the planet and the particles flow down the field lines to the poles. And this process is known as the electron cyclotron maser uh, process. And as a result, the frequency of the emission is directly tied to the magnetic field strength at, the at that point of the planet. And so for a planet with about one to 10 Gauss field, you get emission at about three to 30 megahertz here. This is just a typical example. And so on the right here, I'm uh, posit positing some potentials for exoplanet detections here. This plot from Zarka et al 2007 shows all the bodies in the solar system where we've detected radio emission, the solid filled in points here are the planets, uh, the open circles are the moons of, the, of Jupiter and uh, Saturn. And what you can see is that the radio emission is directly tied to the incident power of the stellar wind. And so in theory for exoplanets where they're close in embedded in this much denser stellar wind, we in theory could get very high radio emission from these planets that could be detected from the ground. Now it's very hard to do this. Uh, there's a number of searches in the literature that have looked for radio emission from exoplanets. Uh, here's a few of the reasons possibly why they've been unsuccessful. I don't really want to touch on these. I want to keep it positive. Um, but one of them is the geometry of the emission cone. I think this is a really important part, point, that the emission is beamed in a cone. And so it really requires a very specific orientation between the observer and the emission. And so there have been many searches not that have detected this, but recently uh, Jake Turner, who is here in the audience, uh, had a really cool result where they actually found bursty emission from the Tau Bu system in 15 to 30 megahertz using LOFAR. And I think this is a really, really promising result that could possibly be the first detection of radio emission from an exoplanet. And if you use their uh, observed frequencies, you end up with a planetary magnetic field strength of about five to 10 Gauss for this planet. The other system, the other way you can have uh, radio emission from a planet is actually the planet induces radio emission on the star. And Lee gave a really nice overview of this in his talk where I've taken the liberty of calling Jupiter a star and uh, Io a planet here, but it's the same process. Um, I was not told, I'm from Lowell, I couldn't use Pluto and Charon, that was not allowed. Um, <laughs> but uh, radio emission from the star at this point, it's the same process. It's an electron cyclotron maser instability, but now your frequency is tied to, tied to the magnetic field strength of the star. And so in theory, this should be at a higher frequency. This should be easier to observe. And so a stellar frequency of 40 to 60 Gauss here should give a mission more at 120, say, to 160 megahertz. And so our group actually did some simulations of this using the Zeeman Doppler image maps that I showed you before. Uh, here I'm showing the magnetic field extrapolation of a very active star. This is the star V374 Pegasi. And so again, it's the same process as before. The red field lines here are the closed coronal loops. The blue lines are the open wind bearing loops. And if I take the theorist and modeler's prerogative and just let everything emit as much radio emission as it can, this is sort of the spectrum that you would expect to see from this system if you were looking for ECM emission. But if we allow only the field line that connects the planet to the star to emit, that's the yellow line here that's uh, zooming around here, this is what you would see as an observer on Earth. And so you have to be really careful. It's a really hard measurement to make. And so props to Jake's team for uh, getting this tentative detection from Taubu. I think this is really, really exciting. Uh, one final result before I wrap up, um, star planet interactions can help us find exoplanets. This is a radio emission from Vedanthum et al. 2020. This is of GJ 1151, where they saw this enhanced emission at about 120 to 160 megahertz. And uh, they posited very bravely in that paper that this is one of the scenarios that could cause this is actually the presence of a planet in a one to five day orbit. And so just a year later, there was a radial velocity campaign uh, using the habitable zone planet finder and the Harps North spectrograph. And uh, Suvrath Mahadevan's team actually found the planet. And so this was a cool, really cool case where the, the spy came first and the, the planet was found later. And so they found this two and a half Earth mass planet in a two day orbit around the star. And so I think this is one of the really cool potentials for the future where we could actually use radio emission to try and find exoplanets. 
And so that's about all I have to say. And so I'll wrap up there and leave the conclusions here. And hopefully I've convinced you magnetic fields are important and not super scary. And so I'll take any questions. Great talk, Joe, thank you. Um, can you comment on anything about a system where you have two strong magnets and there's a highly eccentric orbit? Is there compression? Is there buildup of energy? And then is there some kind of radio flaring from certain types of situations like that? That's a really interesting question. And so one of the things that we've seen with um, the simulation work, I don't know if this has actually been observed, but the, the spy power, the radio emission is actually tied to the local uh, magnetic field configuration, the space weather the planet is seeing at that moment. And so if your planet is eccentric, it's likely moving through regions of closed corona into low density wind. And so I don't actually know the timescales for how those changes impact on the observed uh, things like enhanced chromospheric activity. But uh, I probably there are simulations out there that do that. But yeah, I think that's a, it's a really interesting point. <laughs> question over there too. Hello, I'm Richard from University of Arizona. And my question is, uh, could you observe the radio signal from the, like, the binary star? I think it would be more significant. Sorry, could you just say that one more time? So you're, you're saying that the, the Star planning interaction will create the radio signal. Yeah. Yeah, and and thinking about if the there is a binary star. Oh, a so binary star. So yeah. yeah, absolutely. And so actually, that was one of the lead ups to how we got into the idea that planets could induce this enhanced activity. It was from the binary star world, and so yeah, absolutely. Everything I've talked about here pretty much applies to uh, close in binaries as well. Uh, cool stuff, Joe. Um, can you comment on the recent detections uh, on brown dwarfs, like from Melody Cow at all, and and how um, you know what are we learning from the the isolated brown dwarf magnetic fields, and how does that translate into what we would learn about the planets? Yeah, I think that's uh, it's really cool stuff. The I think the radio is telling us directly because it's all coming from the cyclotron maser instability. It's giving us a direct look at what the magnetic fields of these these extreme objects are doing and so yeah it's absolutely telling us that pretty much all these bodies are magnetized and it's just giving us a, an insight into the strength typical strengths of these these magnetic fields uh yes so we have a question asking how do you estimate the planet's magnetic field strength yeah so there's a few ways we can do it uh using the chromospheric activity uh there's some uh, empirical models we can use to do that uh, the radio emission directly ties to the magnetic field strength of the planet. And so, yeah, we have a couple of different ways we can do that. Uh, thanks, thanks, Joe, for introducing magnetic fields to everybody. Uh, they're awesome. I'm Jake Turner, by the way. Uh, I do have a question. So what do you think is the, the next 20 years in SPY? How are we going to improve all these techniques that you you talked about? Oh, that's a great question, Jake. I think radio is going to be one of the prom most promising things we'll do here. Uh, I think there's a lot of focus now on high energy observations. There's a lot of CubeSat missions coming up. There's uh, I'm involved with the Star Planet Activity Research CubeSat, which, as the name suggests, hopefully we'll find star planet interactions. Um, so I think there's a lot of work to be done here. Um, I know uh, Joe Lazio here at uh, JPL and Caltech is leading the Sunrise mission, which is looking for radio emission, these radio cluster of CubeSats. And so, yeah, I think there's a lot of promising uh, technology coming online that's going to enable these spy observations to be to be firmed up. <laughs> I'll take a prerogative. Um, so it's very impressive measuring the star planet interactions because you have to like link together all these different things. 
where do you think, and this is sort of related to upcoming missions maybe, but where do you think the kind of squishiest part of that chain of connections is? So who should I throw under the bus? (laughs) (laughs) I think one of the biggest unknowns, at least in a lot of the simulation work right now, is the the power of the stellar wind. It's the the density of the stellar wind. A lot of these models take a base density of the stellar wind and then they extrapolate out. And so if you don't know the density of the stellar wind, which we don't, we can't measure that. What we do is we extrapolate from the sun. Um, I think that is one of the free parameters I would love to see us uh, pin down. Let's thank Joe again.